Okay. I'll say that again now so it's on the recording. You've got a funky view of the slides because you're using supercubes. And uh, so I've got the webcam pointed at the projector screen. So apologies, but we're making this work. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Pastor Chelsea Globe. Pastor Chelsea is the campus pastor at the Duff. Um, been there for well, as a as the full time call for a year, almost a year, almost a year. November twenty twenty. So yeah, and then interim before that. So she's had a couple of years. Years, yeah. yeah. So um, I will uh, I will hand it over to her. Thank you, Pastor Sad. Hi everyone. Hi. 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 Thanks for having me here. It's just so fun to be here and see you all. Um, most of you are at the first service, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess I want to start with, are there any questions or wonderings or um, things that came up for you in the sermon um, that you wanted to start with? I, um, I always think it's funny as a preacher because you just get to talk at people and then you don't really give people a chance to talk back, you know? It's this odd dynamic, it is. Um, so yeah, just that is our thing. I have a question for you. When I was in my 20s in college, the college Christian ministry had a us versus them. That was how it was. If we were us and they were them. Well, pretty straight. Is it like that today? So you mean, uh, so so the college campus ministry had an us versus them, like us Christians versus the world yes. kind of feeling? Yes. That's not my ministry. It does not have that feeling. <laughs> At least I really try hard not to. Uh, it's interesting at UW because there are a lot of Christian groups on campus. And of course, the biggest ones are uh, some of the ones you might have heard of um, Campus Crusade for Christ, which goes by crew now, which is supposed to like take out the offensiveness of the word crusade, but like it just shortened the word say you didn't take it away so i don't think it really works um uh university christian fellowship acts to collective there's a, um, a couple of really big ones and they're kind of the big flashing ones with lots of money that that get a lot of students um, did they change their name because of the day the wilkinson association got really right wing and they needed to rebrand the way from I don't know. I don't know about that. I just know that the, the word crusade is problematic for some folks because of the history of Christians crusading and invading uh, other places and killing people and taking their things. <laughs> so that's the, I, I thought that was a problematic way, but maybe I don't know about that. Yeah. So in my campus ministry, I, I tried to create a very open, easy to join group. Um, and and my my point my whole point of me is um, that it's about community first and for establishing a community and then churchy stuff is second so so that's um, that's the feeling that I'm trying to to encourage there is that it's very open door inclusive easy to come to I I don't make any assumptions about what kind of faith people have as they come in so she just that's how you want it how's it going. Good. Okay. Good. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I can't interrupt. No, you're good. Uh, follow up question. Uh, I was raised Catholic and I went to the university back in the Midwest. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I thought about early to mid 60s, uh -huh. in college. There seemed to have been, at the time, a lot of rivalry between the Newman Club, the Catholic, <laughs> yeah. and so called Protestant. Is that still in existence or is a lot more ecumenical cooperation? Yeah, so the question is there, uh, how's the feeling between denominations and different groups? Yeah. Um, I'm, for me, being ecumenical is really important um, and finding people who you can work with is important. And, for, and so for me, if that crosses um, uh, unusual. Um, you know, boundaries there, that's okay. I'm willing to work with any other group that's willing to work with me, and not all of them are. <laughs> um, so like those big, most of those big, um, more conservative Christian ministries uh, don't want anything to do with a female pastor. Uh, so yeah, there's there's some, there's just some so barriers there. That so it's female, not denomination. It's both, I think it's both me that I'm female and it's domination that's known for its liberalism. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm working really hard 
to this ministry actually was coupled with the Episcopalian ministry up until a couple of years ago when they sold their building. And so you'll see that happening more and more across campus ministries where the denominations that have agreements in place that they can work together and that are similar theologically and liturgically will do that. Um, and so you'll see that a lot. You also, right now, that same Episcopal ministry is partnering with the Methodist, the United Methodist ministry. Um, and so, yeah, and, and I'm becoming uh, very good friends with the rabbi, and she, she and I are really um, at the Hillel. She and I are very, uh, hard, we're working hard at getting the clergy gathered, the student facing clergy, because that hasn't happened in a long time with UW. And it's mostly us mainline Protestant type people, and then a couple of conservative, or not conservative, you know, um, evangelical types who will come and play with us, but a lot of them are not interested. controversy in like the 70s or 80s with a chaplain at the UW hospital who was like converting people and there was this problem and so it's like they did a full like slam the door on religious you know stuff um, so now they're realizing oh spiritual health is actually a part of the yes. overall student health maybe we should pay attention to that but they have like no idea how to do it it's fascinating um, and yeah there are when I talk to young people who are either youth or young adults the biggest thing I say is there's especially yeah kids in high school or young adults in early workforce or college none of my friends go to church or like I don't know any other people many other people my age who go to church so that's a big barrier for them for sure to to give a piece of their life to the faith community right so that's why yes community is really important for me that it's a place where they can come and get to know each other and they can bring whatever they believe or don't believe um and just be in a space where we're willing to have those conversations but if we can build that trust we create a community and we get people to be able to talk about it and ask questions um and and figure out what it is for themselves because i don't think they feel set apart from the community or the, the culture I think young people also feel very much part of current culture and they understand why people are anti-religious because so many people have been hurt in the name of religion, right? So they see that. Um, and especially in a denomination like the ELCA or on the more progressive side of things, they also know there's an alternative and they don't quite know how to communicate that to their friends. So I don't think they see it as a, an us and them thing, but they're part of this wider culture as well. So, so it's figured. Yeah. I, I heard uh, Sam Torbert say a couple weeks ago that he felt that you know, he was kind of experienced, but he felt that the thing that was most appealing to young people uh, about the church, I guess, uh, is a feeling of mystery and and uh, a spiritual life sort of based on that. Hmm. Uh, what do you Interesting, a feeling of mystery yeah. that young people. I I think I don't know if I'd phrase it that way, but I I'd say there's no they, they don't want to be told here's the formula here's here's how this works, here's what you must believe in order to do this. And so there is a real sense of there needs to be more gray, there needs to be more putting all these pieces together that seem like they don't go together and, and figuring it out. Okay, part of this was a sort of spiritual Yeah, yeah, right. 
And that's something um, I'm going to talk about too. I'm sorry about how weird this looks. We can't figure out how to get it. You're all fat. Yeah. <laughs> I stretched the picture, I know. Um, but I also can't figure out how to get it like, on the whole screen. So, um, yeah. So, so what I thought I would do today is um, talk about some of the things that I have learned about ministry of young people, uh, kind of the do's and don'ts a little bit. And I know that's something that you all are thinking about and actively working on here. You've got the, the joint youth group starting, which is so exciting. I just love that you are doing that. Um, we, in my form, my first call at Federal Way, we joined with another congregation for youth group and confirmation. And it was so life-giving and wonderful. And let those kids meet other kids from their schools who went to other congregations. And then they saw them at school. It's like, oh, a church person at school in my life yeah so it's important um so even if you don't have a lot of kids in that right now it's so good that you're doing that and that you are investing your time in doing that so support that however you can i would say okay we're gonna skip our little devotional here <laughs> i was gonna show you some of the things we've been doing in our class um, but no, actually, you know what, we're going to do it. So, um, I, I mentioned that I've been teaching a class on Monday nights called Engage in Younger Generations, and a bunch of you folks are in that, or who's here who's been in that class? Kimars, yeah. Uh, so it's using research done by Fuller Youth Institute, uh, and their book called Growing Young, and it talks about the characteristics of congregations that are actively growing young, that do really well with youth and young people. And the crazy thing about this is it, a church can grow young, do well with young people, and it doesn't matter what denomination you are, it doesn't matter what size you are, it doesn't matter what kind of worship style you have. All those things that we think of, of like, oh, we gotta do this and this and this to attract the young people, none of that matters. It's any church of any size of any tradition uh, can can engage young people effectively without changing the core of, of who they are. So just know that. Okay, so I'm going to read this text here um, from John 18, and uh, I want you to think about these questions as we're reading it. So what do you hear this text saying about young people? What do you hear this text saying about elders or older folks? And what might this mean for us in our church? When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, oh goodness, I can't even, you know. <laughs> uh, no. It's funny because it's like not on my screen here either, so. Yeah. Simon, son of John, right? Yeah. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? So he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Oh, I said this to indicate the kind of death by which you would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. How do you hear this saying about youth or young people? You better be nice to them. Because they're going to be leading us around with a the <laughs> They're going to be fastened in the belt to take you where you need to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a certain perspective. Well, there will be, it, it, that's right, though. There will be a flipping of roles, right? And a lot of you who have, who have um, cared for elder parent, elderly parents will know that there's a flipping of roles that happens, right? What else does it say about youth or being young? 
and nurture them, feed them. Nurture? Nurture their feed. Feed. Because sometimes it says lambs, right? So that's young. Yeah. But he does also say sheep. Everyone, the older sheep. Everyone needs to be tended, nurtured, fed. Did you have something you were going to say? Oh, it seems like it's saying that the young don't know who they love because you keep asking them, do you love me? Do you love me? It seems like they don't know who they love so much. It's, and they need to be revitalized and reminded of that. Oh, the young need to be reminded who they love? Maybe. I don't know. How old was Simon? He's a son. He says, son of. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. like a middle generation guy, probably. Right? 20s, 30s? We have no idea. Jesus <laughs> age. I mean, he's actively a fisherman, so he's still working. Yeah. What else? What else do you see it saying about just youth or being young? They have to be asked several times to do things. They have to be asked several times to do things. Hey, that goes for all generations, let me tell you. <laughs> Right? That's why we put the same announcement in the bulletin and in the newsletter. And <laughs> it goes every way. Um, yeah, and also that the, the old will need the young. Right? They depend on each other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then what does it say about, about being old? Or elders, or yeah, what did you have another one back there? Well, just to say that, um, uh, as, as a natural outflow of loving Jesus, these things will occur to be tender. Mm -hmm. So, yes, if, if those aren't working, then we're not loving Jesus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? The loving goes with the feeding of the tending of the lambs and the sheep. What was he referring to when he says do you love me more than age? What, what is his age? That's a really good question. I mean, it's with the other disciples, right? It's the post resurrection moment. What would you say? Is that days? Bill said fish. <laughs> do you love me more than the fish for having for breakfast? <laughs> yeah, I, probably the other disciples, maybe. Yeah, because this is the, the scene on the beach post resurrection yeah. where they're having the fish fry for breakfast and uh, and it's Jesus and the disciples. So, do you love me more than these? I think it's. I think by the phrase, and I'm not sure what it means, but uh, when you grow out old, you will stretch out your hand mm. and then notice that somebody else will pass the belt to them. But, that must be significant in some way, I don't know which one, but as opposed to just fastening a belt around you. Yeah. Stretching out a hand. You have to acknowledge that you need help, right? Um, I always think of when I've visited people in um, rehab centers who have had maybe a hip surgery recently, and Sarah's physical therapists literally put a belt around you. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> to help people, to lift yeah. people up. And so I always think of that with this text that, oh yeah, that literally does happen. Yeah. But maybe there's a, a flip in there that young people are stretching out their hands to us and we're not recognizing. Mm, maybe young people are stretching out their hands. Yeah. yeah. Well, stretch out your hand and you might not be asking for the belt around you, but you're going to get it anyway. You might be stretching your neck or something else. The belt might be what you need. <laughs> that sounds or, like corporal punishment, but um, <laughs> the help that might be the help you need, but you don't want it. You mean? Can I? I know you're trying to say something back there too. I think going back to the fish on the be loving one. I don't. Like, I think we're talking about his life. Like, be loving one in your life. Like, instead of saying like you love me more than your tears, I don't think it's a conversation that I love. Yeah, right. Because they had gone back to fishing because they didn't know what to do. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, he did say you're going to be fishers of men, right? I mean, in the yeah. text. And so then they went back to fish. So, so like, what are you doing here, guys? Yeah. This this passage also uh, illustrates the the biblical uh, way of cooking. Just open fire. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's right. Yes. So for the biblical literalists among you, you shall only cook your fish on open fire. I, I see kind of an intergenerational um, interdependence. That's what I see. Because, because you say when you're young, you used to just do whatever you want to do. You know, now you're entering into a role where you're going to be appointed to feed sheep. And there's going to come a time where you're not where you wish you were, but there's someone else. You know, so I think, uh, you know, we're the, the, the take home message for us elders is not that we've achieved and we're not needy. No, we're going to reach a needier plane. And, and yet, there's, you know, the, the, uh, also the emphasis of the feeding the sheep and feeding the Yes. Plants, so. Yes, that's great. So that intergenerational look at what is what is a community? What is the community that follows yeah. Jesus look like? Yeah. And it has everyone and everyone has roles and those roles shift over time, right? And we have to be willing to see that. We have to be willing to let go of some things that need to. We have to be willing to take on new responsibilities when they need to be. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, what else? Anyone else have a thought about what this means as a message for the church? Yeah. I, I see the, um, do you love me more than these? Christ is saying uh, he's, he's um, equalizing or putting commonality in love of God and love of man. It's love, it's one kind of love. Do you love me more than these? It's one thing. Yes, it's one thing. The love of God, love of Christ goes into loving each other, right? The lambs and the sheep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Oh, it's, I have a whole bunch of texts that are um, that are fun like that um, that you can look at and say, "Huh, what is this talking about? What is this? What is this saying about youth and and uh, being elderly and the other side as well?" Okay. Okay. So in my, uh, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on ministry with younger generations. Done campus ministry for two years and parish ministry before that for five years. Um, but I think I've learned a little bit about, about some things that can help congregations. And I love that piece of this call where I get to share that. So I'm going to wrap up the things that I've learned into five nice points here of to-dos with younger generations. Um, so we're going to just go through those real quick. But here are my top five things that you can do to improve your ministry and your connections with younger generations. Number one, increase compassion and understanding of young people's lived realities. Number two, invest time in relationship building. Number three, don't make assumptions. Number four, be clear about who you are as congregation and what you believe. And then number five, show that, show who you are with action. So we're going to go through each one here. Stop me at any point if you have questions or, or anything about that. So increasing compassion and understanding. So these are questions for you all. So I want you to think about these for a second. Who were your primary influences as a teen or young adult? Who did you turn to for advice and guidance? Let's do those two. Anybody have answers for those? Who were your primary influences? And who did you turn to for advice and guidance? You can just pop name them out. Pastor. Pastors. Yeah. Parents. Older siblings. Older siblings. Are your grandparents back there today? Yeah. Maybe a coach? Church youth group. Church youth group, yeah. Yeah. Roommates. I heard also, I've heard scout leader, um, teachers. teachers, yeah. yeah. Campus pastor. Campus pastors, yes. <laughs> awesome. And what organizations and groups were important to you when you were a young person? Luther League. Well, yeah. Luther League, yes, church, and specifically the youth part of the church, right? Yeah. yeah. Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School. Baptist Youth Fellowship. What? Baptist Youth Fellowship. Yes, Baptist Youth Fellowship. So the youth piece of the church, right? That was just for you. I have a different take on this. Yeah. Not all teens and young adults are doing the right thing. I mean, 
you know, the primary influence for me as a teenager made me look like I was not headed in the right direction. So I'm sure. That's yeah. okay. 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 It's no judgment. Well, I'm just saying, if you're going to have compassion and understanding, you got to understand that these kids are not necessarily. Oh, for sure. We will, we will get there. Oh, yeah. We will get there. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't tend to be, it, it tends to be when I talk to groups like you all, it's more the Luther League yeah. Sunday school crowd, okay. right? Yeah. But also, we have all made questionable decisions in our lives and choices, <laughs> right? No, <laughs> but on various levels of that, we can relate to that as well, for sure. How did you learn about God, Jesus, the gospel? I heard Luther Lee, um, Baptist Youth Fellowship, Church, UBS. Confirmation. Confirmation, Newman Club, yes. Love Catholic, Jesuit educated here. Yes. Chamber choir in high school. Chamber oh, choir. Right, because that's the yeah. one place in school you can, you can sing religious stuff. You can have religious stuff. It's choir. Yeah. I Yes. Yeah, so your own family. So yes, in your household. Yes, for sure. Maybe you had parents who prayed with you at night. Yeah. And meals. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I like and to. I attended the uh, Jesuit High School, so I'm constantly. High school, very good. I got my Master of Divinity at Seattle University um, with a year of Lutheran Seminary thrown in there because they made me, but um, <laughs> good, you know, I had to learn that stuff too, but yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking that our kids and grandkids and grandkids answers to this question would be quite different. Yeah, so yes, you hit the nail on the head there. So, so I want you to think about how that was true in your experience, um, how these things are true, and um, to see how they start to think about how that's a bit different for, for you, the young people now. So the youngest generation is called Gen Z, right? So these are some quick facts. Born after 1996, true digital natives, there's always been some form of um, cell phone and computer. Um, most racially and ethnically diverse generation ever in our country. Uh, that includes religiously diverse families, so people from different religious backgrounds marrying, figuring out how to raise their kids in that. Uh, this generation is more likely to pursue higher education, more likely to hold progressive or liberal viewpoints on social and political issues, have inherited a deep distrust of traditional institutions because their parents were also distrustful of institutions. They're not the first generation to leave church. <laughs> no. They care deeply about climate change. They are more likely to know, use or know someone who uses gender neutral pronouns or pronouns that are different from what was assigned at birth. They're more likely to live at home in their 20s, live with romantic partners before marriage, wait until after 30 to get married. But I think that's changing. I have seen younger folks getting married again recently, um, have kids or buy a house, and all not necessarily in that order, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, so that differs from maybe some of our experiences growing up. What did you see in that list that made it different, right? There's this distrust of traditional institutions that they're inheriting from a, sec a third, second or third generation of yeah. saying, well, church is in a safe place for us to be. Mm -hmm. um, we, the government isn't going to um, be something that will help us. Um, <coughs> schools, maybe, you know. Um, so there, that's not, there's not those traditional places that they're turning to, to go to find stability and find trustworthy adults in their lives. We're not digital natives. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <We're digital laughs> yeah. And, and I'm starting to feel it too. Yeah. Where 
they just know how to do stuff or are plugged in in different ways where I'm like, well, what's that? And um, yeah, it happens fast, um, but it's a really valuable tool and connection point for them, but not their only connection. And they know that they don't want it. A lot of them don't have a lot of social media anymore. Um, college students because they're just like, well, I use it to like kind of, it's like how a lot of us use Facebook. I kind of use it to loosely connect with people, but my real conversations are group texts or, you know, those type of things. Okay. Yeah. And it's not just that these individuals are digital natives, but culture is far more digital than China. Yeah. Than the culture is far more digital, so they're privileged within that to navigate it. Right. When my daughter graduated from college, she had a really hard time finding a job. And so I gave her the same advice that I got when I graduated from college. You go to every store on the street and you get an application. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Dad, they won't give applications. No. <laughs> right. They'll say, well, you go to our website or yeah. here's yeah. a QR code code to bring up the application. Mm. Yeah, it's so different. Yeah. In the in the choir that I think. Uh, so in Seattle, now when new people introduce themselves, oh, they yeah. always give their pronouns. Uh -huh. And that is something that's very yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, interestingly different. For sure. And do you all know why that, that's what you said? Yeah, so more of a trend uh, that you'll see in spaces is for people to include their person, the pronouns that they prefer on their name tags mm -hmm. or an introduction. So, like, and that's a big thing you know. No, no, he, no, she, she they, 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 them. Uh, there's there's lots of, uh, and there's more choices than that out yeah. there. So uh, that is has become important for places that want, it's a signal that says, we understand the reality of people's experiences and they are welcome here. So even someone who is, you know, born a she and always identified as a she, me putting she on my name tag signals, oh, this is a pastor who I can talk to about my reality and my gender identity, and they're not going to judge me, right? So that's why you see that in spaces like you've done or in the public schools and my um, my first grader, you know, the teachers will have their pronouns on there. How do they make that right before the name? Or no, mostly before. after, yeah. yeah. Or sometimes if you're in a class, you can say, uh, or on a Zoom call, you can say put your pronouns in your in your name, or uh, and and usually it's an, it's not a have to, but it's an invitation mm -hmm. because also some people you want to be open to people who maybe are wrestling with their gender identity or not out in that way, and so you don't want to force people to make a decision.